Welcome for our next Cafe release dedicated to our road to session zero count. We have a little bit of technical issues uh, in the background, but uh, yeah, let's stream and hopefully things uh, will go fine. I'm joined by uh, Zedek. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Zedek, or Zedek, Zedek Siu. Uh, I'm a writer, primarily a writer, uh, based in Podixen, Malaysia. Great. Uh, and uh, oh, did you? Oh, well, yeah, I got my ice breaking question. I'm all over the place today. Uh, what is your routine like uh, at the moment? Uh, is your part of the world, I would assume, it is uh, affected by COVID as well? Sure. Um, let's see. So just today, so just this evening, it was announced that my district uh, would enter a uh, strict lockdown. Uh, so it's it's basically a full blown lockdown, uh, which uh, which is really unfortunate because up to a certain point last year we almost beat the pandemic, uh, and because of uh, well essentially uh, political leaders in Malaysia not actually quarantining themselves, we got a resurgence. Of the of the plague, so um, we're yeah we're 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 pretty bad right now. Yeah, so I live uh, so for 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 us personally, we're now confined to a ten kilometer radius. You know, like we can't go out that kind of thing. So just today, <laughs> I just started today. So, so yeah, the cool beans. What is your day like? Do you do you work from home? Are you unemployed like me? Uh... Uh, so I, me and my partner, uh, so I live with uh, my partner Sharon, who is a visual artist, um, and uh, we uh, we work from home because, uh, well, so because her studio is at home, and I work here because I can work for any from anywhere and like. Uh, so it is it is a very homebound existence, uh, lockdown or not. Um, uh, yeah, so daily life is uh, wake up, work at the computer, uh, cook, uh, do some gardening in the evening. Uh, once in a while, because uh, Podixen is a beach town, so uh, at least until today, uh, we could go out, go, go out to a beach. Uh, so there are certain stretches of the beach, of the of the coast which are quite quiet. So we go there and like uh, watch the watch the like waves, I guess, and like speak to the mangrove trees or whatever. <laughs> um, the our town is also uh, so we've got two refineries. Uh, so within we're within like 200 meters of like one of the big refineries. You can actually see the lights behind me through the door there. The, oh, uh, wow. Uh, so the, so there's a beach, there's like a mangrove, there's the, there's the, there's the tide coming in and out. And then right off the, where our favorite beach is, there is a, uh, where the, the patrol tankers, uh, load and offload crude oil. So that's, uh, the wasteland of industry, uh, uh, colors of horizon. Yesterday so we what... we went on a walk with my wife. Uh, we 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 walked a bit further than usual, and we made it to a place called Surrey Keys here. So all the way to uh, the one of the bank of the the Thames River here, and it's it's a residential area uh, a bit. I mean, it's it's cute, but it's a bit boring. But it's those, it's a residential area built in place of a former industrial area. So you got those large places where you used to have shipping ships stop, and so on. And it's mm. it's so quiet <laughs> and boring, sort of there. It's very difficult to imagine when it was still industrial with big ships coming from all over the the world in in the area. Uh, have you picked up any new hobby or interest uh, lately? Uh, 
so uh, so the big let's see uh, so since this actually since this since the end of December till now uh, as things have progressively gotten worse uh, sort of like in our in in my own context uh, besides the lockdown we also have a, we are also in a situation called uh, Darurat, which is a constitutional emergency. So our constitution allows for emergency powers to be declared. And what has happened recently is that uh, we got a, uh, basically a, an emergency declared spuriously because all it does, uh, it's ostensibly to fight the pandemic, uh, but it's also suspended parliament and elections. Wow. Uh, so you, it's not hyperbole to say that we got our democracy suspended. Uh, so that's the background of why I've, I've, I've dove in full heartedly into, uh, painting, uh, Warhammer miniatures. So well, that's it, my new hobby. It's nice to uh, I just, I just want to zoom in into like a tiny thing, uh, I, I painted so much over the weekend, like a like sort of like six hours straight that I now have like a very really severe neck ache, so I'm a bit stiff. Uh, yeah, so that's a new that's a new hobby I picked up just this month. Well it's great then you won't end up in the situation of so many Warhammer fans of having too many unpainted minis. You are you are catching up with your backlog. Uh, uh... I, well, I don't think I am in, I feel like there is not that much, uh, I'll, I'll probably start first before that happens because they're so expensive, uh, to, to get. So yeah, this is just, exp it really is just the exchange rate and stuff like that. Let's zoom in in more gaming and, uh, get away from, uh, from more ice breaking, uh, about the news. Uh, tell us a bit uh, about yourself, about your work, or, or did you come to the hobby and or did you start it writing your own material? Which, by the way, I tweeted a star of OSR because I had a friend when I, I told uh, a group of friends, oh, these are the people I'm going to interview as part of Session Zero Con. That friend was like, oh, you're going to interview ZX too? Wow, he's he's a big oh deal, gosh. and I was like, "Wow, that's cool." <laughs> I I always the last one to know. That's uh, that's why hopefully uh, my interviews balance between being uh, clueless to sort of fresh because I can interview big stars and have absolutely no clue. So apparently, uh, uh, people are enthusiastic about you. That's a uh, uh, that's both flattering and incredibly embarrassing. I don't know how to react to that, uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't don't really know what. So, so anyway, how did my, it start? My, my, it's, it's true. I so I've been writing sort of RPG material for about two years now. Two years, I think that's about right. Two three years. Um, uh, because I was. So the thing, so I was always re I was always interested in role playing games, but I never got to play them until I was like in my late twenties. So that's when I started, and uh, I started playing fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, uh, which. Uh, so I never really played um, as how people kind of traditionally start, which is like they go to their hobby store, like they have their. their if they're college groups or whatever. Um, and then, uh, so that happened in Kuala Lumpur, the city, like the, the, in the big city basically, but I, about 10 years ago, me and my partner moved to where we are now, which is a small town away from the city. Uh, so the only way I could play was online. Uh, and I, because I started reading uh, lots of, uh, I stumbled across, uh, 
I can actually recall like specifically which blog it was. It was Patrick Stewart's blog. Um, so Patrick Stewart is a like OS like is a one of the many many figures in the OSR sort of blogging sort of blogosphere. Yeah, I, I'm and so clueless. I'm so clueless that when you said Patrick Stewart, I pictured somebody else. Yeah, he often gets that. Uh, but he uh, so like he wrote uh, Silent Titans and uh, so like. Uh, He's most well known for uh, an adventure called Deep Carbon Observatory, uh, which is a uh, which which is, re which is really cool. And uh, yeah, I, I he he's work is really cool. Uh, but I remember that I stumbled across his blog because not for any sort of RPG reason, but it was I was I was searching for references to a book uh, about. Uh, the Zomia like Highlands. So, if I like, I'm, I'm sure I'm getting details wrong, but Zomia is a is a region of mainland Southeast Asia, which is uh, in the sort of uh, periphery of uh, sort of Burma, Laos, uh, that region, uh, where. Uh, uh, so the book was called uh, "How the Art of Not Being Governed." So it's a it's an examination of uh, sort of the the ways of self organization and lack of governance and the relationship of sort of independent communities in the Zomia Highlands versus uh, the big states of mainland Southeast Asia like Siam and uh, Burma and all the rest. Um, so yeah, and Patrick Stewart had a had a had a blog post about this 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 book about a sort of real life reason, and uh, having read it, he was like sort of like mining ideas of what to do, or how how sort of being inspired by this book and the details in it, uh, and sort of looking at it through like I'm writing an RPG, like how can I uh, what details in this book is are interesting to me. Uh, so that's how I got into, back then it was uh, Google Plus. Uh, so Google Plus had this constellation of like, a community of like OSR sort of creators and like uh, writers and artists. Uh, and that's how I got started making role playing game material. Oh yeah, I'm dealing with the chat room because we are very unlucky with the, the technical side, even the the stream is struggling today. Uh, it's really frustrating. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I was just double checking. I actually met Patrick Stewart uh, at Dragon Meet and interviewed him uh, briefly uh, uh, back in 2018. Uh, so people can, can check that out. Uh, so what, um, what is a, so you, your big project at the moment is a thousand of, a thousand islands. Uh, what, yes, what, right. what is that about? And sorry so, for the, uh, I'm just gonna, sorry people for the image. I'm going to try to sort things a bit out here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so please don't pay attention about the, the video going all over the place. Uh, let's see, a thousand thousand islands is so. I'm not the only person behind thousand thousand islands. So this is kind of like uh, if we're talking about thousand thousand islands, you're talking about two one half of that project. So it's me uh, and uh, another Malaysian artist, uh, Mankao, uh, and we've been collaborating for several years now on this uh, project called Thousand Thousand Islands. And it is a sort of series of zines uh, that are individually gazetteers of uh, sort of fantastical geographies. Uh, sorry, should I continue? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I cut myself off from the Zoom, uh, hoping it will free some uh, bandwidth. Uh, sorry about that. Right. Uh, 
okay, so Thousand Thousand Islands, it's a series of gazetteers uh, of sort of polities or islands, literally, or towns or cities uh, that are that are inspired by uh, sort of pre-colonial Southeast Asian uh, myth history and material culture and also lived uh, reality. Uh, I'm not sure how else to describe it. Um, but yeah, I guess we can check it out because we've got a website and a web store and everything now. So I've seen a couple of videos also on YouTube uh, explaining uh, its content. Um, a lot of it seems to revolve around a, uh, what's the right word, um, sentient uh, civilization of crocodiles. Is that something which comes from uh, sort of local traditions or is it something you, you made up uh, yourself or a mix of the two? Well, the, so, so the, the, the crocodiles come from our very first zine. And I think we're up to zine number, oh God, I, I can't really remember which ones we have publicly and which ones we finished but not published yet. And let me just check real quick. Uh, we're up to, yeah, we're out to six zines now and the, the crocodiles are from the first one we did. Um, uh, these zines are all like fantasy. So like none of them are, are meant to be representative of anything in particular. Uh, but, I, but I will say that uh, crocodiles are a big part in a lot of stories, uh, both in my sort of local state uh, and also uh, the most famous crocodile story in Malaysia it comes from East Malaysia. Uh, and it's often, uh, so uh, there's this, there, there's this big crocodile called Buj Bujang Sendang and uh, it was a sort of man-eating crocodile that terrorized this one part of this, this stretch of river um, and yeah, so there, and there are a lot, of, there are all, all these other stories about how, when you, I used to buy a lot, lots of tabloids, like local sort of tabloids, uh, tabloid magazines. And, uh, the zine is partly inspired by, uh, what a feature I remember from one of the issues, which was, uh, communicate like, a, an interview with a family whose daughter would frequently be uh, uh, possessed by uh, the spirit of their great grandmother who is a crocodile. That's cool, uh, tabloids uh, yeah. as an inspiration. It's interesting that you came with this inspiration for a sort of medieval fantasy game rather than, I don't know, something like Monster of the Week or a more contemporary occult uh, uh, stories. Um, right, so that comes, so the, the sort of medieval, uh, the non-modern uh, angle comes from, so like this was originally, this, this began as uh, a sort of idea that Mankao wanted to pursue. And Marco is a is a visual artist, and all the images that we we have in our zines really come from him. And a lot of the where the zines begin come from him give, sending me a folder of images. Uh, it really started as a sort of project for him to sort of look into and do research on material culture uh, in uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and this was this was a artistic response to the the strong feeling that both me and Macau had uh, and continue to have that um, the idea of history and the idea of uh, or the memory of what our culture is like uh, is very shaped by sort of nationalist narratives. Uh, this is probably true for all the 
nation states in Southeast Asia, but at least in the Malaysian perspective, um, we the the conception of our past or our national past, the myth of our national past, is a uh, very uh, focused on a particular uh, kingdom called the Sultanate of Malacca, and uh, the the kind of uh, the kind of visual style and textile style of that particular culture. Uh, and also the idea that, uh, which is very ahistorical, a- a- the idea of uh, that uh, uh, sort of homogenous Islam- uh, Islamic sort of culture. Uh, and so, and, and, and that's that idea that that myth of the national history is, is in many uh, in many respects the way it is because it is a um, it helps buttress the sort of um, uh, ethnic and religious sort of uh, uh, power structures of the Malaysian nation state itself um, and um, so at least what Maka wanted to do how we react to this is that it's very boring <laughs> uh, because there's there's only this one so there there in in ev- almost every representation of sort sort of like um, the Malaysian past or the Malayan past uh, is the is a costume called the Bajum Layu, uh, which is a which is a which is a sh- which is a shirt and a, pa- a pair of slacks and uh, a, a sarong tied at the waist, and this 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 hat called a donkolo, which is a uh, which is a wrapping of, of textile fabric into various styles. Uh-huh. And the individual, so the individual manifestations of these things are very interesting. But just because it's so married to nationalist uh, agendas, there is only one style. There's only one kind of image. Uh, so. His, I believe, the nexus of the 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 begins the sparking point for his thing in two thousand thousand islands was like, this can't be the only kind of fashion there was. Um, that's why a lot of, uh, especially if you buy the, especially if you look at the art scenes for thousand thousand islands, um, Makak draws a lot of characters and there's a lot of detail with, with the costuming and like what people wear, and also the. The, the textiles, uh, because traditionally in the region, textiles are, uh, and how, how they are made, how they're dyed, how the patterns, what their patterns are, were really important. Uh, so like it was just, uh, just looking at what else was there. Uh, so th- his process involves a lot of like looking at, uh, trying to look through all so if, uh, like sort of uh, uh, ethnographic or anthropological texts, uh, historical texts. And yeah, of course, all, a lot of these sources are also written by, uh, uh, also come from the colonial and sort of post-colonial uh, Western sort of academia, but those are the only kind of sources we have. Um, yeah, so exploring what other kinds of things people might have worn, what other kinds of um, sort of uh, things like uh, what did a what did a house look like, what did a bench look like, what did a particular kind of uh, puppet form look like. Uh, so you'll find that uh so like one of the most recent zines that we completed uh was basically inspired by uh maka was looking into uh in malaysia it's called it's a form called kuda kapang Mm -hmm. so it's a it's a puppet of a horse and there's a ritual involved and it's there there's a dance involved uh and there's a whole like sort of like a a social context uh, around it's like uh, because it, I don't know whether I'm 
so forgive me if I'm going on like lots of uncontrolled tangents. No, I think uh, it's it's very interesting, and I, I'm gonna throw you further in tangents once you're done. So don't worry. Okay. Okay. So uh, anyway, there's this zine. There's this zine that basically was inspired by a form called Kuda Kapang. Uh, I can't quite recall what its what its name is in Indonesia, but that's where uh, its earliest form originates from. Uh, but yeah, so it's basically a, the sort of a puppet which basically is a horse head, and the dancers ride the horse puppet, and are and at least in the in the real world they are possessed by the spirit of a spirit of a spirit of wild abandon uh, I mean, it's not explicitly so uh, but they they become like very strong they dance on glass uh, things like that so that well, one of the zines we, we finished most recently was uh, inspired by that idea it's anything and uh, oh how did that translate in terms of, of gaming then those horse puppets or or, or do or are they involved in the the story or, or the setting i'm very curious now what they do so the <laughs> the um so primarily because uh i mean i'll just i'm not i'm not really a rules I don't really have a mind mindset for sort of rules and or mechanical number things. Yeah, I so believe. Correct me. Times, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but I believe your your supplements, your zine, uh, thousand thousand islands, uh, is actually uh, system agnostic. So yes, you don't you don't right. have stat blocks and all this sort of stuff. No, no. So it's uh, all if... nice, good setting material for you to use with whatever system people use, right? The the reason so uh, Malka and I were so like we started playing Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition at the same time, uh, and uh, we kind of bonded because we were both in sort of like uh, the art world circles in Kuala Lumpur, and we bonded really closely because it's like oh shit, do you play games too? Oh my god, like. Nerd. Can we talk about this? <laughs> like, yeah, because uh, you know, you go to an art opening and there's like wine and like people talking about like uh, I don't know, like serious art stuff. <laughs> and like uh, we all be like downstairs, like saying, "Hey, hey, hey do you want to come to my house and we can do a like a land party or some shit like that?" <laughs> uh, so, so and, and but the thing about it is that always, eventually, you find a way to make your. Uh, to justify your hobby. So that's how we turned it into work. Um, so we got the idea to make the zines because uh, he wanted, so like he was making all these images and uh, he's also, he, both he and I collect uh, a lot of role-playing books uh, because they're kind of like an art book really, uh, like fun images and stuff like that. So we wanted to make uh, we wanted to make material like that, and because I was already uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of I was really into looking and sort of like uh, participating very limitedly in like the OSR sort of community. It's like uh, yeah, let's make let's write. Um, that's right, material for RPGs. Um, and always, and one of the harder things to do is like, uh, sorry, not one of the harder things. The, 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 the thing, uh, a big thing that the, a, a big way in which the OSR sort of ethos influenced our work is that um, there's less emphasis on particular rules or mechanics. Uh, but how do you create uh, sort of concrete feeling um, situations uh, that that are written in a, such a way uh, are written cognizant of the possibility and the inevitability of a bunch of players, a bunch of human players getting involved. 
Um, so that's how our zines are written. I don't know whether that answers your question, but yeah, uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, just going back, the, your your previous uh, discussion actually reminded me. I I happen to watch. Uh, something called Monstrum. It's a series, and it's about monsters. And one of the latest episodes they released was uh, about the Pontiniac, who, uh, if hmm. I'm not mixing things up, is from uh, it, it's as a Malay origin. And I, I find it fascinating what you were explaining because what was explained in that video, which was not made by uh, someone from Malaysia. Uh, it was made by an American lady, but she was explaining that apparently uh, th there were different aspects to the Pontiniac which were quite fascinating because the Pontiniac's legend. So it's uh, for people, uh, maybe, well, maybe you can explain <laughs> better what, briefly what, what a Pontiniac okay. is. So the the most popular conception of, uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you bring up this, uh, uh, this thing. Thank you. Uh, this the subject. So the, the 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 most popular conception of the Pontiana is that um, oh god, <laughs> the thing about it is that there's so much variation. Well, the way so she, she describes is... it, it was that uh, that sort of a vampiric ghost of a woman who was created when a pregnant woman has been the subject of uh, physical or even sexual violence. And she lives in the trees in the jungle and attacks uh, people. So that's that's sort of the way she presented it. So I don't know if it was appropriate that's or not. A, um, uh, let's so like the the popular uh, it's kind of right. So it's it is it is there are a lot of spirits and sort of like. Uh, spirits of evil, spirits of vengeance uh, that, that surround uh, childbirth. So a lot of the a lot of the most popular sort of stories about hantu. So hantu is the, the Malay word that roughly translates as ghost, monster, mm -hmm. uh, spirit, um, tend to focus on the it's it's either a stillborn baby or a uh, woman who uh, has uh, has died at childbirth, or a, a woman who was the, su the subject of violence. Uh, uh, yeah, so I believe the Pontiana is uh, a woman who has died at childbirth, uh, who or or wronged in wronged by a male figure uh, who then is a sort of vampiric or uh, predator. Uh, I, yeah, sorry, I, I can't... No, no, it's uh, perfect. It, it sounds about right. And But what I thought was fascinating... The, the, the issue, the, 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 I, I think, so like my, the interesting to me, thing to me is that um, especially when when Hantu are portrayed in outside this region, they, it, it goes through a certain process where, okay, what's the archetypal uh, uh, figure of the Pontiana? And uh, because there, there's whole constitu uh, constellation of these monsters um, and they're all, they, they all a spectrum, uh, but once it begins to be portrayed, so, one of the zines in Thousand Thousand Islands, one of the supplements does delve into this thing. So the supplement is called Hantu. Uh, and I was sort of trying to write about and sort of examine uh, how the portrayals of Hantus become solidified into a sort of a canon when it goes elsewhere. So the, the uh, ghosts like the Pantera have actually... Uh, been included in some of the bestiaries and some monster manuals of Dungeons and Dragons of Pathfinder, I believe. Uh, and those use a kind of, uh, oh, the Pontana is this, and this is how it is different from a vampire. And this is how it is different from the Penangalan, which is another kind of uh, a ghost, uh, a hantu. 
Um, whereas uh, when when we are when we are creating and we are writing, we are trying to sort of portray what it is like here. Uh, these these specific instances are the 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 Pontiana is not a type of monster. It's not a species of monster. The Pontiana is the Pontiana. Uh, just like Dracula is a Dracula, is, is Dracula. Is, he, like the, the idea of the archetypal vampire comes later or is applied to figures like Dracula. Yeah, things are uh, codified or you, you've yes, got uh, yes. emulations and suddenly it's, it's not an individual with specific powers. It becomes an archetype mm. for... A wider things and then the archetype evolve and then you end up with instead of Dracula who was a baron who was cursed because he did that thing you end up with uh, vampires which are sort of scientific creatures who sparkles yeah <laughs> like... so that their classification so that and, and that's a very interesting thing when it comes to role-playing games because when you when, when how monster manuals tend to be written is that uh, this monster is a medium creature, medium-sized creature that is an <laughs> outsider, whatever the outsider category is. So it's taxonomical, and taxonomy is not. Uh, so one of the reasons, one of the ways in which, uh, one of the, the guiding principles that we that we follow when we, we make and and write a thousand thousand islands is that we can't have these kind of clear taxonomies. They can't, there, there can't be a difference between a demon and a god and a, and a powerful spirit and uh, like a nature spirit and a god. What is the, because there is no, there is no taxonomical, taxonomical clear difference, not in the sort of Western scientific way. Which, which are somewhat recent stuff, even in the Western world. I mean, if, if you look yes. at tradition, goblins, leprechauns, uh, Newton, you know, different regions of Belgium and France, they, they would have different names for all this stuff. They're sort of similar, mm. but none of them look like a goblin, which is sort of what Tolkien wrote at some point, and then and then Gary Gygax did something with, with them. And now when yeah. we say goblin, yeah, yeah, yeah. we see a, a goblin all the same way rather than this uh, sort of spirit who does stuff which are a bit unclear, depending on where you are. So the so like one of the we, one of the words we use very often when we come when we're describing our project is porous, uh, uh, por porousness and ambiguity, and I think it was important for us to retain that spirit because uh, classification and taxonomy, uh, census taking categories are co for, for this context at least for our lived reality are very very. Uh, it, they are uh, they are most strongly represented by colonial era sort of policy that has that has continued to affect our lives today. So it's it's by resisting that in our work we are resisting the sort of uh, well I at least view it as a sort of form of resistance in in the imagination. Um, so instead of writing writing a Pontiana uh, as like this, the Pontiana is a monster that is in the vampire in the vampire type. I'm just not going to I'm going to use the word vampire differently. It's not going to be a classification. It's not going to have these neat uh, like this is this figure a monster or a god. And I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to uh, the the word that's going to be used is the word that the 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 characters in that particular context in that particular fiction are using for that to describe that particular monster uh, or being. It's situational, uh, so, contextual, experiential, rather yes. than. Uh, a classification which you know yes. what i find fascinating uh it's always difficult for me to bring that up because i i don't want uh, i mean there, there are serious colonial issues which are, which are still very alive today uh but what what's often missing from the discourse is that those colonial uh you know practices 
are practices which were done, uh, air quote, at home, also by the ruling class. So this kind of yeah. in indigenous tradition and complexity and porousness uh, of not only mythical creatures and myths, but even history are the simplification of processes which have been taking place in European nations mm. and across European cultures. You take places yes. like uh, France when, or Belgium. When you administrate an empire, when you, when, you, when you think in terms of borders and in terms of coloring your borders, you want everything simplified. And that affects the, the hinterland as much as it affects the capital. Uh, at least in terms of these kinds of simplification. Uh, so that's so that's also an interesting subject to explore, I guess. And um, I, I've been, I've, I'm, I'm glad you, brought, it's, you bring in that. Uh, it's interesting because I need to the the next scene I'm, we're, that we are working on, sort of a city scene that has a sort of imperialistic sort of outlook, at least for itself. And these are kind of the things that Marco and I have been talking about. Um, what does it mean to be a center in the in uh, what does it mean for to be part of a society that views itself as a center and how does it impoverish itself yeah yeah that's an excellent point how does it how does it become a narrative i mean that's a dynamic we still see today all the time of you you treat yourself as the center and it becomes a good way for the ruling class of that so-called center to trade outsiders as the other to fight. So it's it's become less about, hey, look, fellow citizen of uh, this imper uh, imperial country, or you are poorly treated by your rulers. It becomes actually you're part of the empire yourself, and the, the real enemy are outsiders, and that mm. that's about imposing and, and, your and rule. Please go and fight. Yeah. Please go and fight the savages, uh, and die for and be be a patriot for your for your culture, and and we get to spend where you spend your life. Uh, but what I thought was fascinating yeah. in that explanation of the Pontiac by this American lady that she explained. So that that's not a new. I mean, the colonial history, and especially we like a place we like Malaysia. It seems it's it's not a new story so before having western colonials you had uh i'm not sure it's the right term but uh islamic colonials and she was explaining how the pontiac was this apparently there's a city if i understood correctly there's a city called pontiac and the the funding story of the city was that the the muslim ruler sort of fend off the Pontiac from the forest and created that, that city following following that? I'm not certain because I can't recall. Uh, there is there is a sort of uh, founding myth of that particular like city, but I can't really recall what it is. So I, I don't want to... Uh, but like... So the... The interesting thing about sort of pre-Western colonialism in Southeast Asia is that it was never so. What the main innovation that the white, like uh, white colonial colonialists brought to us was industrialized colonialism. Um, traditionally, a lot of kingdoms and mandalas in Southeast Asia paid tribute to China, for example, uh, but. Uh, the reason why the uh, Western colonialism has been the most enduring uh, and the most destructive is because it was industrialized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, it kind of like how the, the I mean, like slavery, uh, there, there was a long history of slavery in all polities everywhere, but the transatlantic uh, slave trade is an industrialization of that trade. And that's why it, it had such a big and terrible took a big and terrible toll. Uh, so similarly, the arrival of uh, the Portuguese, the Dutch, uh, and the English, uh, at, at least in Malaysia, these are the three major ones, uh, was uh, that this was destructive in that way. Uh, yeah. Just staying with I the, 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 the Pontiac. 
just thing with the Pontignac, uh, uh, because I, I thought that that was also very interesting. So what they were explaining was also that for a while there was a, a cinema tradition of movies depicting uh, Pontignacs, uh, and apparently for quite a while those type of movies got censored. And I think it was until the mid the 2010s that. Uh, horror movies were uncensored again, and they made a movie again featuring a, a, a Pontignac. But I, I thought it was interesting to see how a mythical figure like that has been the subject of different waves of ruling classes engaging with the myth or forbidding his yeah. depiction in certain media. So I can, I can, so I can't speak for Indonesia. Uh, but I can offer a, a sort of account of that sort of history with regards to Malaysia. So, uh, in the very so we we got our independence from uh, from the British Empire in 1950 in, in the 19, late 1950s, uh, and in that sort of era, the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, I believe, and there have been sort of academic sort of uh, and cultural papers written about this that uh, the golden age of Malay of post post independence Malay cinema uh, there are lots of there are lots of ghost ghost movies hantu about hantu so there's lots of Pontiana lots of uh, uh, Harma Jadian which is uh, what uh, is conventionally uh, translated as weird tigers. Uh, uh, Orang Minya, which is also another psychosexual monster, so it's like a, it's actually it actually was was sort of conceived in the nineteen fifties. It's a basically it's a guy who uses the magic spell to become really oily and goes around assaulting women. Uh, so there there are lots of these sort of uh, sort of like really uh, red in tooth and bone and sort of gory and sort of like. A, uh, just lurid to stories about monsters, uh, because for the very first time, I, I uh, th this this would be my interpretation for the very first time, uh, we are seeing ourselves in our, the kind of stories that uh, on on the screen. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, and at the time, the the cine cinema was kind of a, a medium that brought the community together. You get a guy coming in a project coming with a truck and the projector to the village and then they set up a big screen and they watch it together. Uh, and then, so censorship of monster stories, which, uh, and monster stories being seen as un-Islamic and uh, in Malaysia, at least Islam is the national sort of religion. Mm -hmm. um, that came during the uh, the Iranian re like in the aftermath of the Iranian revolution when there was a kind of like resurgence oh, wow. or revival of of uh, of Islam sort of uh, across the world and then there was this and then there was this perception so that this this hyper conservative hyper nationalist and uh, uh, it in Malaysia, at least, it was paired with our sudden uh, drive towards uh, modernization. So it, also, it was also kind of a modernizing uh, force. So you want to be. So it was. It was the. I think you would. I think you would. I would characterize it as it was the Islam as the cleric in the in the Western business suit. Yeah. Okay. Who is saying that we shouldn't make any more. Uh, films about monsters because this makes us look backwards and superstitious and uh, we should be modern and, 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 and scientific and uh, uh, sort of looking at like very uh, uh, severe interpretations of what the Quran would be uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, that, so that period, so, that, so we still get uh, resurgences of that thing, of that kind of censorship, where it's like this is un-Islamic uh, because it kind of makes us look bad. 
for 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 thinking or believing that in these kinds of things. Such a fascinating history. I mean, uh, a country with uh, with its local history and tradition, which has been the subject of colonialism from China, from Muslim uh, expansion, from West, several Western countries and industrialization. And, and you look at something like horror cinema and it's impacted somehow by a revolution taking place in Tehran, in Iran, uh, which is was also uh highly influenced by by western powers so, you know just the how things from another side of the world can have repercussions uh to yeah. another country is is quite fascinating and it's much less of a new thing than than people um people assume yeah yeah I, so for example i i think the the thing that's most uh or, or most present in my mind is that uh, the biggest effect of Western imperialism in Southeast Asia is that the nation states, the post-colonial nation states of Southeast Asia, have just learned to do that to to do that kind of imperialism to themselves and each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is this big thing. So if you if you look at the way, um, so I mean this is very common, like uh, in the big cities of Southeast Asia, like uh, in in Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. Uh, uh, people from the Filipino and Indonesian hinterlands go to these cities to work as sort of like underclass, sort of working class. Um, and that's what is that but imperialism? Like, uh, and so it's so we've learned to replicate those things uh, that the colonial masters did to us to each other. Uh, so yeah, that there, there is the effects of those waves, those various waves of, of things happening elsewhere, happening here, and then we learn how to do it, and then we do it to elsewhere, uh, is is uh, ongoing thing. Uh, yeah. Going into something uh, more positive, we we getting close to to the end of of this interview. Uh, oh, but... sorry. No, 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 it's uh, uh, all of this is, is very good. I'm just very frustrated about the technical side uh, and I hope the, the recording sure, won't sure. be too poor. Uh, no, no, but uh, I just want to, <laughs> as we're talking about uh, transborder things, things across uh, different Asian countries and even beyond, uh, what about session zero, <laughs> Uh What are your plans for, oh. <laughs> for that convention? <laughs> I'm sorry because like uh, oh no, it's we, we it's absolutely really fine. Much it, about games. Uh, hey, I, I brought um, up the Pontiac and I had reasons for that. That we might record more things later regarding this. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, to to end on a on a more joyous note. Uh, not that again, I, I absolutely have no issue uh, discussing uh, dif difficult topic. I think they are they are important, and uh, yeah, I got the privilege of being able to look at them. Uh, uh more as a well somewhat academic subject uh the, rather that i mean they, they don't directly impact my my life uh, uh other things impact my life so uh yeah uh but <laughs> uh yeah session zero con what's what's your plan there are you gonna have a little booth are you gonna run games uh, or will people so, be able to interact with you there yes so basically what will be happening is that i'll be there on the day uh, Mankal will Mankal might drop in and out, but I'm, but we're we're actually like, super, he's like super busy like handling stuff that, uh, I'm glad I'm not handling, which is like some logistical stuff and like, uh, figuring out how to get because one of the one of the effects of the pandemic is um, that we can't get our zines to we can't mail our zines to anybody. Uh, because our postal system has, our postal service has decided that there's no outgoing international mail, which is very annoying and very frustrating. Anyway, uh, so like I'll be there. I will have. I'll be sitting at a booth for a thousand thousand islands, and I just people can come and like talk. I don't know. <laughs> so I'll just be there. Uh, but in the evening, at around like ten. 30 i believe so around the time same time that we started 
uh, on the day. Uh, it will be me, uh, Philip, uh, God, I don't want to, uh, Philip, who is a, who is also a publisher and a, 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 a like a, a exhibit the in session zero and BJ uh, uh, ratio who uh, also is a, a, a exhibitor and sort of game designer and whatnot. We, the, tr the three of us will be talking about uh, language and, and translation in RPGs uh, because all three of us come from contexts where uh, although the a large section of the role-playing game community uh, our play in English, we come from more general contexts which are not Anglophone or less than totally Anglophone. Uh, so it'll be a, it'll sort of be a, just a discussion about like, because I'm, I'm interested in issues of translation because I, I also moonlight as a translator. Um, and like how, if we are to write and to imagine material from our context and sort of like uh, be inspired by our context. Uh, what does it mean that the, that the medium of communication of this imagination is in English and so overwhelmingly in English because role-playing games are so overwhelmingly played in the English language. So I don't know, I mean, it's, it could be really rambly, uh, but I'm hoping to try to get a bit of structure to it. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what I'll be doing. that's what I'll be doing. You know that that's a topic I'm very interested in too. Uh, we had a um, Metatopia panel with uh, Pam Punzalan, uh, Di Diego yes. Noguera, and um, Alan. Alan, I I'm not sure about his, his family name anymore, but. Uh, yeah, that's a big question. The the use of English. I mean, uh, you know, the, in back Pam was supposed to be part of this of this of this of this sort of panel too, but uh, she 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 realized that she had to run a game. So <laughs> I was really lazy and I didn't want to run any game. So yeah, good call. Uh, good call. But uh, yeah, I think I hope I hope there will be more discussion on that topic, but across different places. And uh, uh, I know. RPGC, of course, uh, it's really not, I think in RPGC already said that, but is inspiring other regions of the world to make them some, themselves more visible on Twitter in the TTRPG community. So I there's RPG LATAM now for Latin America. Yeah. I, I hope they will also emulate Session Zero Con and maybe do a panel also about their own relationship to the English language. Uh, I should try to do mm -hmm. one uh, one day in with French. Uh, it's... Yeah, because because all all these individual so again like one of the one of the interesting things about sort of thinking about this subject is that a thing to avoid is to to be to have the conversation be dominated by how do we speak to the English language world um, because like the the how language functions in the Philippines is so vastly different from how it functions in Indonesia from how it functions in Malaysia. In Singapore, and we are neighbors, uh, and I'm sure that how it functions in Brazil and Argentina and all the Latin American countries would have their own individual things. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm with you in that there should there should be more conversation about this, and conversation not quite in relation to the US UK. <laughs> the US UK whatever <laughs> that is that's a, that's also a weird weird situation the UK and the the US I mean the US on on their own it it's quite weird and and the UK which is uh, I mean is a country I, I love uh, it's it has a difficult history it's got a very difficult present and the relationship with the US uh, regarding that is is even more complicated so they are I mean, uh, I'm definitely not in support of Brexit, but yeah, the UK, the continental Europe has things going on, including with its relationship with English and languages in general, 
that uh, native speakers here in England uh, don't don't have. Uh, I need to point out potato potato dialogues. I'm not sure who that person is, uh, but in the chat, uh, Rachel. That's Rachel. Oh, Rachel. Uh, Hello, Rachel, Rachel. Rachel was yeah. a, a, our first guest. Uh, she yes. she's posting. Uh, she there. Uh, um, she's posting a, a lot of uh, information. Comprehend language is a country panel will take place from. 10:30 to 11:30 p.m. GMT plus eight. So uh, go take your time zone converters there, uh, and the speakers will be Zedek, of course, Ordolia Publishing's Philip, and Buko Juice Games BJ Resho. And people can register to the event at sessionzerocon.com, which I need to double check if I'm, if I'm properly registered. And Rachel was also adding Yay. that. Thanks, Rachel. I'm so sorry that I'm <laughs> such a bad, like, uh... Well, you, yeah. it's, it's yeah. about different point of views. It's not, if each episode we were just banging on the same information about Session Zero Con, it, it wouldn't be as interesting. But Rachel was pointing out that there will be two tables, two virtual tables, dedicated to RPG LATAM in Session Zero. So, uh, plus also tables from Korea. We should have a, a guest from Korea. Uh, why why are people yelling our names in the chat room? I don't know. Gasp. Kalum. Kalum. Zedek. Haha, I got you, Zedek. <laughs> oh, nice. oh. So I don't see the chat at all, so... <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> no, no, nothing wrong. People just typing uh, our, our name. Um, oh, actually, uh, Carol Isham from uh, Malaysia who was our guest on Film Studies. And we need, we need to talk about Pontiniacs and the RPG Academy Film Studies uh that uh, that should happen so uh i need to Carol is also really cool you should check out his work yeah his, uh, yeah he's his awesome. graphics on twitter i believe check our episode about uh the never ending story and role playing with children uh that we recorded i'm gonna post a link in the chat room and i'll put one in the description of this episode uh do uh yeah what's your goodbye and where can people find you when you wish to be found and, and your projects uh, so we can be found a thousand thousand islands can be found at a thousand thousand islands.com we've got a web store that we launched a few months ago which we are still really proud of uh even though we haven't gotten like uh regular updates on it uh but that's where you can buy pdfs of the scenes uh, they are sadly at this very moment unavailable in hard copy. Uh, Mankao has a Patreon. It's it's also if you search a thousand thousand islands, that's that's his Patreon page. I will put um, it in the description of the episode so people. Oh yeah, well, it was copy pasted in the the chat room, so I can copy paste it from yeah. here. And I'm ZXU on Twitter and wherever else. I'm I don't have a fancy name. It's just my name. <laughs> But that's fan I had to make up a name. I had to make up Callum to have a, a fancier name. So the ZXU, it's great. Uh, I didn't find several. You know, uh, sometimes you got. I, <laughs> see, I mean, no, it's not a criticism, but Patrick Stewart. There's a lot of Patrick Stewart. <laughs> there's only one ZXU. So you see, you are you are better suited than uh, than he is and many people. Uh, yeah, thanks I dislike that. I disliked my name when I was very young, but I guess uh, it's paying off now. I don't dislike my name. It's just, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I like I like the idea of taking a, an alias to to do stuff uh, in the TTRPG fair, scene. Fair. Uh, yeah, people, thanks to myself. You can find me at Rollispod pretty much everywhere: Instagram, Twitter, and uh, even TikTok. Although I'm not very active there anymore. Uh, there were a lot of people in the chat room. Thank you so much. I'm trying to become an affiliate uh, Twitch, so that helps to raise. I'm just missing the average number of viewers. It's probably because I, I stream too much things which are of no interest, like people like myself editing or playing video games. Uh, people, I encourage you to follow us on Twitch. Uh, go check the recording of this uh, exchange on YouTube. Go le leave a like or a comment there. That helps make them more visible and and yeah check the check the show check our rpg academy film studies about the never ending story and um uh, i will probably try to organize uh, a film studies about the uh, pontiniac uh, i'm fetching the full title what is it uh Pont 
Tignac, I'm losing it. Uh, yeah, uh, the Pontignac Malam anime, a movie from 2003 uh, dedicated to. Yeah. Oh, uh, Pontignac uh, Arum Sundal Malam. Malam, yeah, from 2004. Is it good? Do you know if it's a good movie? <laughs> I don't want to say because I didn't watch it personally. Okay, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll find out. Thank you so much, Zedek, and I look forward to, uh, well, running into you at Session ZeroCon. I will try yes. to stream my whereabouts in there because you, there's a nice looking map and so on, so people will be able to, to watch that. And without waiting, I'm going to go to register, and everyone should do that right now. Thanks, Edek. Thanks Bye. for having me on. Yeah.